Welcome to your favorite comic book channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And uh, the topic of conversation today is the Stan Lee documentary. I think our review might surprise you. All right, Jimmy, let's get into it. It's by popular demand, and uh, I don't necessarily couch to popular demand, but when uh, Uncle Jeet here hits us up <laughs> and send us an impassioned email about what a cartoonist kayfabe review of the Stan Lee documentary might look like, well, that means I have to at least now go see it, because I just ignored it. I'm not a hate watcher. I'm not a hate listener. I uh, felt like I knew what it was going to be, and I've heard it all before, so I'm like, fuck it. Like, you know, this is just another thing for the fanboys to be crying about or talk, talking about or whatever. Um, it There was a blip on the radar for me when the Kirby family puts out a statement. Basically, it, it was talking about the contributions of Jack Kirby and the creation of, of the characters and stuff. All the, everything that we've all seen and heard before. I wondered about that because, you know, famously the Kirby family, Kirby estate, reached a settlement agreement with Marvel Disney several years ago. Right. And it did make me wonder, like, I, those terms are undisclosed. Yeah. So it's all speculation on my part as to what those terms may include, but I assume they would include some stuff about Kirby being the co-creator of all the stuff that he was at least the co-creator of. And I did not see that represented in this documentary. So I did kind of wonder, like, is this, I wonder if this is above board, if this is something that it might not sit right with their settlement and again that's speculation i don't know what yeah, those yeah. terms were yeah but kirby did not get much representation in terms of being credited as the co-creator of the marvel universe and many of the characters that stan lee talks about creating in this documentary he says jack kirby was the first guy to draw mm. the silver surfer and it's the legalese right so so knowing that this would like flare up hemorrhoids and shit like i just wasn't even paying attention yeah me either and this is a disney produced documentary the first thing i thought about you know like i i have a list of notes and stuff i kept as i watched it um it reminds me of the wwe documentaries yeah you know they produce so much content and i listen to a lot of wrestling content and a lot of the critics will kind of talk about how one-sided this stuff is sure you know because there are nuts stories and they're spun you know and, yeah. and maybe it's inevitable if you're telling stories i mean Look, it's a euphemism for lying. You are going to spin them. But this is clearly that kind of like, this is a Disney puff piece on Stan Lee. I like to think of it as Meowist propaganda. We interrupt today's video to tell everyone we will be at Baltimore Comic Con, September 8th, 9th, and 10th. We also want to remind everyone these videos are brought to you by the Cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon. There are three levels there that will get you access to our videos ahead of everybody else. And the King Kayfaber level, you'll get all the videos first and you'll get to sit in on the recording sessions. These videos are also brought to you by the books that we make. Ed Piscor's Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus, collecting all of the Hip Hop Family Tree comics in one handsome volume, along with 140 extra pages, will be out this fall. The proof is here, and it is shipping now to comic book stores and bookstores near you. Put your name on a copy ahead of time if you want to make sure you don't miss out. Red Room, Crypto Killers. The final series of Red Room Comics is now being serialized. Issues 1, 2, and 3 are available. 4 will be out shortly. There are two trade paperbacks of Red Room. They are all self-contained. So buy whichever one you see first and enjoy yourself. X-Men Grand Design is going to be collected. All three volumes in one oversized volume this fall from Marvel Comics. Put your name on a pre-order for X-Men Grand Design if you want to get that in time for Christmas. My latest books, True Crime Funnies, three nonfiction comics, True Crime and Wrestling Comics. These are available on my website or on my Patreon. Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive from Image Comics, collecting eight complete stories of the Deadliest Girl Alive, the Plain Janes for the young reader, young adult reader in your life, and the Hulk Grand Design Treasury Edition is available now wherever books and comics are sold. And now back to today's video. Yes, <laughs> I think that's a valid way to look so at it. So Kim Jong-un <laughs> type propaganda. It really is because it's it's... It was on Disney Plus, I think, is where this thing premieres, where you can watch it at home. And it's like right in between all the Marvel shows. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is just really, yes, if you're drinking the Kool-Aid, this will be uh, this will be the next round. So as people who've been in the game for our whole lives, basically, as fans and, and creators, <clears throat> there's been a lot, like, 
you start off kind of more doe-eyed and you're like, oh, Stan Lee, and, and, and you hear all this stuff. There's not one thing in this that I didn't know or didn't hear before in the same fashion from, from Stan Lee. Uh, so none of it surprised me at all. But I guess what maybe somebody like Uncle Jeet, who's such a respected like academic and scholar of comics, what might rankle the feathers, because I didn't pursue the conversation further in email, better let's have our conversation here and then have a conversation with Jeet after. But uh, I imagine that the thing that really makes people mad or nervous or whatever is that because this is on Disney+, Plus, like a piece of Kim Jong-un fucking propaganda, the Fairweather Marvel Studios fans or whatever take this as gospel and don't investigate any further. And that and that's tremendously fucking sad. That's that's a super bummer. Yeah, if if people take one thing away from from this video, that's what I would hope they take is go investigate these stories because like you said, you know, one of the notes that I had written down was, did you learn anything new in this? And you've already said you've seen all this before or heard it before. I feel like I have too. This is maybe the most popular debate in comics, if, or at least in the creator side of comics, is who should be credited with what yeah. in, in the Stanley Jack Kirby debate. And so this stuff is pretty well known. If you're a lay person, however, or if this is your first exposure to that story of Marvel Universe and Stan Lee, do a little more digging because there are definitely other sides to this story. Yeah, and like and, and it, other people involved. Yeah. So aesthetically, like one of the things that G pointed out was uh, the part where Stan Lee's talking about the differences between Kirby and Ditko, and it shows the bullpen and. Ditko and Kirby like have spaces like inside of the Marvel offices, which is just not true. Right. We can look at that. That's a, that's a storytelling device to just like get this to 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 happen cleanly within the space of this documentary. But to the layperson, it would create the the perception that everybody's like you know it's an in-house studio thing. Uh, that's a convenient point of view when it comes to the idea of work for hire because like a lot of um stuff that you'll hear jim shooter talk about that he's very proud of um but is really like illegally a sn snake like is providing the tools and stuff for all the freelancers like i don't want you to spend a dime on any of your stuff like uh, we'll, we'll give you the paper we'll give you the nibs and all the stuff like phil, phil felix my lettering teacher at the cubert school he used to talk about he would get a gross of um Hunt one of twos, like straight from their like little closet. What that is at the end of the day, when it comes to work for hire, is that uh, it's 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 um, sh sharpening up their position as you being a carpenter within their factory because they're they're providing everything, and you can't quantify brain power or anything like that. But you could quantify paper, pencils, stationery, all of that kind of thing. So like the optics of that bolsters the work for hire legalese which is puts Ditko and Kirby in like a bad position in, in, in a lot of ways I think that that's set up for the bullpen because that is one of the things that stands out is it, it's a very bizarre choice knowing that that bullpen did not exist ever in that manner right but there was always it was referred to it was one of those Stan Lee-isms in like the Stan soapbox and the Marvel bullpen yeah. you know that column of text there was this idea of like it's the bullpen, the Mary Marvel, you know, marching society's yeah. all there, you know, you're Jolly Jack and everybody's in, in house. And it was kind of this fun fantasy for a kid reading a Marvel comic. And in a weird way, I assume that's what they were going for. Right. I actually like a lot of the production. Like, like there those, was a lot of models are pretty fucking It was cool. cool. It was cool. Yeah. And, and they would show like the artists with the drawing tables with stuff on there. Ditko with the thing, with the thing. On, on his drawing totally. table. Love that. So there were some fun little details. I thought it was really photogenic. Like one of the strengths for me of this documentary and watching it, probably my favorite part, is just I love footage of any of these guys. Yes. And and I wish more than Stan Lee had footage. But you know, like there isn't that much footage for those guys. There might not be any for Ditko really. Right. And so with Stan there is a ton of it. And they lean on that. And I, I think that that's something you do as a filmmaker where you go, What do we have here? And it's like, you know what? We've got the biggest persona in comics and we've got lots of hours of footage of him from throughout the years. 
we got to show this stuff we got to use this stuff and i think from a documentary viewer standpoint that stuff's gold to me even if some of the stuff he's saying i think is is not true yeah it's still really exciting to watch stan lee being stan lee what I'll say is, is like, I'm so happy to have see, seen that footage. I've never seen a lot of that elsewhere. Yeah. Like, the very, very first piece that opens up where it's it's old Uncle Stan and, and like, and when they show the, the photo montage and the older he gets, the more the hair grows. It's, it's amazing. Like, that that's, like, that's low-key subtle. Like, like the editor was doing something there. And I, and I want to come back to that uh, that exact piece maybe because there's there's a big thing that we have to talk about with that but that video where it's it's you know receding ha hairline will eisner face stan lee with no glasses or persona he's reading off a prompter and has none of the excelsiors in it and and it's later than you would imagine because the titles are behind him mm -hmm. And I was guessing, what did you come up with for date? Because I was figuring late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, I, I don't think 70s, but but it's it's late 60s. Yeah. Like, based on, like, the titles that you see behind him, which I thought he might have created the persona earlier, but then you realize, nah, that's pretty 70-ish. That's, like, Studio 54 or Stanley or something like that. Um, going back to, to that, because I just want to make sure I get this on the record, man. This is, a, this is, a, this is me being a, such a friend, because Tom's Stan Lee book is, is coming out sooner than later and Tom worked on this book for years and this Stanley documentary is new it's 2023 and it's so fascinating and and it's making me nuts because uh, the film did something that that Tom did years ago but people weren't gonna see for another month and they're gonna reference the documentary they're going to say he got this from the documentary and it is just not true we mentioned it on a um on like our first kind of review of it or maybe when we were talking to we did a couple little videos i see that the the, the company sent us the books so that oh, that'll be a sunday video maybe next week or yeah. something like that uh p like page one tom does the standard stanley spiel which is this whole documentary we've heard it all with the same pregnant pauses and stuff and what Tom does is he does a kind of Warholian color scheme POV of like, it's almost like the, the Marilyn Monroe uh, silk screen, except it's the aging Stan Lees. It's all the different Stan Lees and their ellipsis on every dialogue bubble to carry the sentence so that it's to imply that this is his like worked out sound bite that he's used for decades and decades and decades. Uh, and so he's done that. And he made that aesthetic choice. And like that's at the beginning of this documentary too. So it's like that thing where it's just like, it's such perfect synergy. But I want it on the record that Tom did not use that as a motivator for, for like his comic. It's just, you know. Yeah, and it's great in the comic. I remember reading that in the comic and thinking like, this is amazing, brilliant. And it's great seeing it in the video. It's, it's the same deal. Like the transformation of Stan Lee from person to his persona character is so compelling to me and and it's represented in both places you know like i was thinking about coming in to talk about this and it's like he's the biggest character uh, as far as a person connected to comics yeah i think steranko might be number two i was trying to figure out like who's next because there are a lot of characters in comics and now we sort of have a lot of people at, like the mcfarlane character level but stan lee is like head and shoulders is like the character persona yeah and i think that documentary that montage footage same with Tom's book. I think it's a really great visual illustration of what that transformation is. I'm a little bit surprised that they that they have that in the documentary because it kind of speaks to the idea of like we know Stan Lee is the salesman. But I mean, I don't know, 30 years as a writer editor, you know, so I don't know how to identify him in those terms. You know, I, it, the salesman is such a big, loud, colorful boisterous first version of him that I ever saw. Yeah. Like that's Stan Lee to me. But like I say, decades as like the guy who looked like an old an old man in the late sixties, right. you know, he was. So yeah. it, it's really interesting to think of those two pieces and I'm kind of impressed that they would put that in the beginning of the documentary that way. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's a move. I, I think that's a that's a, you know, a warts and all. Like like we're gonna do this like look at how revealing we are, but then stick to the after mag. Mm -hmm. kind of uh, kayfabe of, of, of the whole thing. Um, I tried to note some of the stuff that, you know, were um, 
I think inconsistencies between Stan's version of events or the documentary's version of events versus maybe other accounts. And one of them that stood out early on is Joe Simon and Jack Kirby are working in house at Marvel yeah. as day job producing those comics. And Stan Lee shows up as like office boy. And he's like, after a while, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby left timely. Right. They didn't they didn't just decide to leave. Right. They were fired whenever it was exposed that they were moonlighting and doing comics at night for other companies. And I believe the person that exposed them was Stan Lee. There was a lot of there's a lot of language. Like like you could parse the language and it just makes the guy look scummier and scummier from like, you know, corporate overlord kind of uh, position because he says things like you know, work for Timely. First off, no no mention of nepotism, of like his relationship with the publisher. And he could go either way during various conversations. None in this one, but like maybe it's on, um, you know, the Will Eisner conversation or something on his VHS tapes that Stanley used to do or something. But he would mention a relationship with, with uh, Martin Goodman, the publisher, that it's like a cousin or like whatever that is, man. Uh, no mention of that in that, so in, in this documentary. Uh, but then there will be language like, yeah, and over at Timely, we, we had, uh, you know, our biggest title was uh, Captain America and like our, like like this ownership kind of thing. And, you know, that kind of continues with, with the, uh, you know, Jack was the first guy to draw Silver Surfer. And it actually just reminded me, like, like I said, not interested in hate, hate watching stuff. So I avoided this, but a place where maybe you are watching something for one reason and then Stanley pops up, and then you're like, "Fuck you!" What <laughs> is that? Uh, In search of Steve Ditko documentary, where you see exactly how media trained and legally trained Stanley is when they broach the topic of uh, cre the cre creator of Spider-Man, and Stanley will say stuff like, I will allow him to believe that he is the creator of Spider-Man. And just like all of this gymnastics to not give that ownership idea to uh, Steve Ditko, because that would be, that could be exhibit A in a billion dollar lawsuit. And he knows that. So he's going to skirt it with, with language. And he is a writer editor, man. So he has some proficiency with the written word uh, and knows, knows how to, uh, you know, slang some hash. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and that comes up again later on. He mentions about how, uh, and this is a quote, every word of dialogue was mine. This comes from the famous radio interview. It was a Kirby interview, and yeah. Stan Lee kind of crashed the interview. Um, again, like people watching this, go listen to that. I believe yeah. all of that is available online, and it's fascinating to hear those two talk, and that's, that's, is that in the 80s whenever they have that conversation? Late 70s or mid, 80s? Mid-80s, mid mid-80s. It's Jack Kirby's birthday, and they they pulled a sneak attack yes. on him, basically. Like they, it's it's fanboys uh, that have this radio show, and that's a good radio channel because that's we're off the hook. My favorite hacker channel uh, show is is uh, housed, and um, they think they're doing a nice thing, you know. And like the conversation, like Jack is getting old, you know. That's a famous one where like Jack, what is the origin of the demon? And he's like demons have existed for 10,000 years and it just like he's uh, he's done uh and they're just fanboys talking about such minutia to a guy who drew a hundred thousand pages and has no idea about this one specific thing that you're talking about uh then comes Stan, Stan Lee when you listen to the actual interview there's a bit of a pregnant pause from Jack Jack he's getting adrenaline like mm -hmm. like yeah. like his heart is beating now because he didn't sign up for this and now Stan Lee's there and they're they're exchanging pleasantries but then Stan Lee got to come in with the barbs a little bit man like I will say that every every word like every, what, every what word of dialogue was mine and and here's here's the problem there are photocopies of Kirby pencils that have dialogue on all of them and a lot of that dialogue you can line up with the printed comic. So, I mean, that's just factually incorrect. Well, let's talk about this, uh, this great innovation of the Marvel method, which I do not discount as being a great functionally. It's genius. It, I, I did think about that. They, he, he describes it pretty clearly. The Marvel method, for people that don't know, is here's a plot. 
let the talented artist go and turn that plot into the actual story, you know, the, the panel by panel story. And he explains that it came about because they were understaffed. He was writing as fast as he could and guys would come in with a finished story. They would need a new story and there wasn't a script ready. I don't know whether this is true or kayfabe or what, but that was the way Stan Lee presents it in this documentary. So he would just tell them the, the, the rough outline, the plot of the story, and let Steve Ditko go back and draw that, you know, so that he wasn't out of work while Stan was generating the script. This is brilliant because it, 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 it does the thing that I say the best comics do, which is one, one storyteller. You know, it's allowing the cartoonist to actually do the storytelling, which a full script doesn't always allow. It makes the cartoonist more of an illustrator, which doesn't always work. You know, like there's a magic in comics that's kind of hard to explain, but it relies on the storytelling from panel to panel. And that really usually comes out of the artist. And the, and the artists having that sort of um, latitude they're going to make something visually exciting. They're going to draw the stuff exactly. they want to draw, exactly. and it looks great. It's the easy difference to point out bef between a Marvel and a DC comic, where the DC stuff looks like clip art from like the Silver Age. You know, it's a fucking extremely boring to look at. And uh, the the Marvel stuff with you know, all of its rawness, there's crazy shit going down. Uh, but as he's describing the you know this Marvel method, so functionally the Marvel method rocks. Uh, because, I mean, just like, sh take a look at, at a detective comic and take a look at any Marvel comic and, and compare the two. The, the artist doing the heavy lifting is doing some fly-ass stuff. That said, it is important that the writer can respond to a story that comes back that's right. weird and panels that are like, wait a minute, what's happening here? How do I make this tie in? And I don't think that's a skill every writer has, and no. I do think that's a, a powerful skill that Stan Lee brought to the game. Yeah, totally. But... Uh, he devolves it so far into, and he says it. This this is why, like, this is why my sort of feelings on human humanity start to get <laughs> called into question because it's the snake oil salesman literally telling you that he's not doing much, like, and 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 sometimes like, if you just watch the visuals, they might not put the actual visual of. Stan Lee and Joni at fucking Coney Island in bikinis and shit like that over top of when he says, I would just tell Jack, you know, Dr. Doom gets you know, engaged to Sue Storm. But like you're at the fucking beach while Jack Kirby is sl slaying away at this. And then you're just playing jigsaw puzzle by seeing how many words you could fit into these fucking pages, man. So like, but, but people aren't. The, the lay person that we are met, this, 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 this amorphous lay person who's probably not going to see this video or be swayed by, you know, our, our discussion, uh, they're not thinking about it that critically. They're just kind of like watching, oh, it's Stanley from the, from the cameos and stuff, the creator of uh, Spider-Man and all that shit. But he's telling you that he didn't do, he's the writer, but he ain't doing, like, if plotting the thing out visually ain't writing, then I, I don't know what is, but he's so, it's like, Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of like what writing is like to to like the physical act of writing is like a writer uh you because like he'll talk about like like I plotted the thing and it's like well five minutes ago you just said that uh you know Doc Ock you know kidnaps uh Aunt May and, and go do that for 22 pages yeah, turn that to 22 pages <laughs> yeah yeah and, and so he says it but that doesn't nobody you know the the, the Joe Average ain't Put into it right, together. and this is another one. If you've spent time reading comics journal interviews and reading biographies of these guys, you know Wally Wood had a cup of coffee in early Marvel and left because of this. Yeah, because of fighting over like, well, you shouldn't get paid for writing that. I wrote that. Right. I should get paid for it. Um, so there's a lot of history around this topic, and none of that's addressed. No, there's no alternative point of view about this but the thing is he says how little he does that's what i'm trying like like i can't believe that people like we're calling him the creator of everything and then uh he's describing how little he does on that upfront piece and how he gets surprised by stuff they didn't go into details but we know for a fact silver surfer was a curveball that, that he did not foresee yeah there's a lot of that um he talks about the origin of Fantastic Four's creation. That there are definitely two different versions of that origin. Uh, Black Panther, two different origin, two different versions of how that character was created. Um, and and by the way, Thor, all, all of and, uh, and I mean like Kirby did Thor stories before the Marvel Thor. Yeah. So 
there's a lot of discrepancy there, and that other point of view is not represented at all. The uh, the Sean Howe book, Marvel Untold Stories, that's something that we should unpack over time. Yes. Like, like every, you know, like get into a weekly thing and go through all the chapters. And that's something I would highly recommend again. If you're watching this video and you're going, hey, I like that documentary, I want to know more, that Sean Howe book is a really good one. So from what I remember, because it has been some time since, since, I, since I read it, but it stood out to me when I read it the first time, and I, I think I'm going to get this reasonably right. Uh, Marvel was being very corporate about social issues in a way. So like in the documentary, he's talking about how rah-rah he is, about the hatred of the Vietnam War and and um, being a, a kid like a friend to the new youth movement and Black Civil Panthers rights, yeah. like like all of that stuff. But in the Sean Howe book, it was actually described that like they were pretty corporate and standoffish about that for a while until like that's sort of how they realized that the college kids were paying attention because so much feedback was coming in. Like, why don't you guys have multicultural scenes, like uh, background characters or, or, or prime characters? Uh, why aren't you discussing this or that? And, and there was so much change happening. And you see the difference, because like, all that you get at DC is like the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams goofball comics. Uh, and everything else was very sh sh strict and, and, and cookie cutter. But it was almost like they were forced into it because their 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 audience grew up. You know, they were probably like the five, six, seven, eight, ten year olds who were reading the very first uh, comics, yeah. and then now they're eighteen, nineteen, and they're a little righteous, and and they're potentially getting uh, drafted into a war that they don't even want to be fucking around with. So uh, it's the feedback that made that happen. But he, in his in his Maoist doctrine, he's uh, talking about how. Like he's taking the authoritative position of being at the forefront of that when uh, I, I don't think that that was the case. Yeah, I think you're right about that. There's a really cool footage in that documentary where he and Julie Schwartz are on some show talking about... I want to see that whole show. Me too. They're talking about the age of readerships. And the thing is, like at some point, Stan Lee... And, and some of the stuff that I think is really interesting about Stan Lee is not in this documentary because he goes out on the college circuit. And there's a little bit of that. There's some footage from some of the college talks and stuff. But he really kind of latched on to that idea once they discovered that there is an audience in colleges and they're interested in learning more about this stuff. Stanley took advantage of that and really, I think, sold books. Yeah. So in this, I guess it's television footage. It it's some kind Tom of Snyder. interview show. But Julie Schwartz is there and Stan Lee is there. And Stan Lee's talking about how he, he thinks that college students should be able to read this stuff. Don't dumb it down. And I think some of that's revisionist history and that he saw that college students like the comics. So, yeah, jump on that. But I, but regardless of how you get to that point, that's fascinating to me. Yeah. Because it really illustrates the difference in mindset of DC and Marvel. Totally. Which we see more and more as we get into some of the history of comics. And, yeah. and you're kind of reading how these companies are evolving and publishing and their successes and failures. You really see that dichotomy between, I hate to say Marvel going for older readers, but that's literally the clip. Like Stan Lee says, older readers. Yeah. And I always thought that happens like late 70s and into the 80s. It's pretty early on that Stan Lee is throwing out like, we've got older readers and we are, you know, we're not pandering. We're going to try to do stories. And, and the younger readers can rise to that. The, Again, it may be a little revisionist history, but I love that topic and I like seeing it represented there. That whole piece, like, like I want to see that whole conversation. Uh, there is a college kid who is saying that you could do great stuff comics can be great and julie shorts is fighting that yes. notion he's like this is little kid stuff there is a disrespect of the potential of the comics medium by these very important gatekeepers including stan lee because even at the beginning i had the whole nom de plume is a function of his embarrassment mm -hmm. of the medium and he just continually talks about how low level comics is and how, how whack it is and how trash it is i was glad that was in there because i've heard other other people of his generation say that yeah and and that always would upset me because it'd be like some artist that i loved and they and they were they would lie about their occupation because it was shameful at times especially post you know like the senate hearings the comics code type stuff. yeah yeah totally and like you know in the 70s like julie schwartz man like no wonder Jeanette Kahn comes in and is like yeah, I think we need to clean house because we got these stultifying old dudes. It's a great contrast between Julie Schwartz in that clip 
and Stan Lee at the beginning yeah. because they both look like old men. But by the time they're on set together, Stan Lee's the guy. Yeah. He's this persona of joy and excitement and, and, and almost youth, youthful exuberance next to this like stodgy old guy, just you know, upright, stiff, short hair, bald. Who's fighting the notion that <laughs> yeah. comics can be good. He's in the business of comics and he is fighting tooth and nail, arguing with this college kid saying that that is not the function right. of comics and uh you know that that is one of the endemic things to our culture is is nostalgic fanboyism corrupting the creative path mm -hmm. or even the business there's two everybody's a fan and they're a fan of what they're a fan of and maybe not there are these noobs that come in and like are the ones who are pushing things further because they don't have the corruption that we have with all of our long boxes and stuff, you know, like they're, it's really them who are going to propel and evolve comics. But, uh, you know, Jolie Schwartz, one of the early fandom people, sci-fi fandom, early Lovecraft dude. Uh, if you read, uh, if you read Lovecraft texts, like, like Jolie Schwartz has some, has some, administrative thing to do with hooking up with like Arkham House and like getting HP Lovecraft like elevated outside of the pulps so he that's a very specific niche you know and it's also a niche that you probably had to defend tooth and nail in the 30s or even the 20s when you're going through the depression right and fighting to be a fan of that kind of stuff so he's got all that scar tissue that has built up over the years and uh very narrow focused and uh so that conversation it's it's um was it that was it an apple commercial where it's like there's like the the goofball and then there's like the cool guy who's the apple you know it's, it's steve jobs bill gates right like it's two complete different cultures yeah it it, it couldn't have been illustrated more clearly and i, I that do that think that stan lee is very media savvy yeah and recognized at some point like here's our advantage and i'm gonna sell the hell out of this stuff and then he had had experience talking to these college kids by the time they did that TV show, and it showed. Right. He looked so comfortable sitting there, yeah. and Julie Schwartz looked like, you know, be like Nixon in his presidential yes. debate, just kind of sweating and, why are you asking me these questions kind of thing? <laughs> and, and, you know, it really separated Marvel DC, I think, very well. I like that footage, and I'm curious to see more of that. Hey, you know what? There is something that, that I took away from this that was new to me. And it's pretty early on, but whenever he's in the Army, he talks about how uh, they found out he was a writer, yeah. and they and they and they assigned him stateside and he said that he rewrote like training books as comics right and one example was something the training thing went from six months to six weeks with the comics as like the educational tool right i don't remember hearing this i mean i feel like that's will eisner's that, that's a corner will eisner has has made part of his history on yeah have you heard that before no. i wonder you know like that might be something jeet here can can set, shed some light on was stan lee doing educational comics for the army in the early 40s yeah because i did not hear that before yeah uh, yeah I and it's fascinating if he was i think it's in tom's book but also like the steps to get from point a to b like there's a lot in there that that is, is missing um that whole part i'm just because the way he puts it is the way that like you know a lot of like draft dodge and fellas would, would put it like Turns out I had bone spurs or like, or like that type of shit. Like where he's got to put on this affectation of being sad that he couldn't like be in combat. And like, I volunteered and blah, blah, blah. And, but then it turned out, I volunteered. So it's that thing. I volunteered. But then it turned out that, you know, like I didn't have whatever his excuse was. And uh, man, I'm throwing no shade at anybody that ended up stateside in combat. Because yeah. I would be very happy if, 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 if it came to that, if it was going to be drafted or uh, enlist. And if it was going to be in combat or stay home. Well, like, yeah, no doubt. But but like uh, what I'm saying is because of all the kayfabe of the conversation, I, I'm, I'm sure deals with Uncle Marty like made something happen. It's possible. It's it's more the contrast between him and Kirby, who we know did combat yeah. in Europe. Um, you know, like even the beginning, I think of Kirby as Lower East Side, right? He was born poor, Stanley Upper West Side. Yeah. You know, so... <laughs> he, he may not have been very well off, but he was better off than Kirby. Like, the contrast between those two is pretty interesting the, throughout their entire career. Yeah, I never saw a photo of Kirby sitting on a pony. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
he has some stuff he talks about like the villains as being as popular as the heroes yeah and again i don't know if that's revisionist or not but i think it's something we could all apply to our storytelling sure I thought that was a really insightful piece that idea of like you have your flawed heroes of course but also like think about how that applies to those villains i thought that was really good um he yeah, did, he, did, he talks about stuff that, like, I don't think he's really accomplished in the, in the comics where he talks about um, trying to come up with the plausible reasons why the villains do the dastardly things they do. And I've read a lot of Stan Lee comics, um, and they, they are pretty, pretty one note, tie somebody to the train tracks kind mm-hmm. of characters. Yeah, Doctor Doom might, might, you know, show, pull somebody from a fire, or, you know, Doc Ock might be trying to charm out. Aunt May and get into them them bloomers. <laughs> but uh they're he, what he describes is right. It's the right thing to do with your villains. You know, that's Jack Kirby and I mean, I mean that's uh, that's Jack Nicholson and a few good men, right? Like try to figure out and a uh, and apply logic to the dastardly thing. But I don't think he's ever done it. Yeah, I can see that. Um the biggest gap that I saw is whenever you know what was fun footage? He gets promoted to publisher, and they show footage of him talking to the board of directors. Yeah. That board of directors room, I could have watched hours of that. However much footage they have of the board of directors, talk about the old dudes in the room. Right. Man, I was found that compelling, because there must have been 20 of those board of director guys around, like, giant square, you know, the old oak tables kind of thing. Just the stodgiest looking dudes ever. I would have loved more context for that because that was some. I'm surprised they'd even let him shoot any footage in there, and it wouldn't surprise me if that was 100% kayfabe right. to the point of being almost like found footage or something, or actors or whatever. But but it made me think like a big part of his, to me, his story is whenever he steps back from making the comics, I'm under the impression he goes basically to the West Coast to try right. to sell the comics to Hollywood and spends couple decades doing that yeah. like, like in a lot of ways like from the time of the Marvel Universe creation probably spends more time in LA trying to do deals on TV and movie shows with some success and I think probably with opening doors and making connections that continued on to like the Marvel uni- Cinematic Universe Yeah, and they really don't address it at all and I'm surprised by that because I've read biographies of him that's a big chunk of his life. Yeah, totally. There was a uh, the 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 toys that made us the the Power Rangers episode. He, you know, like one of the early successes was not an American success. It was the it was the Japanese Spider Man, and that Japanese Spider Man is like the start of the Tokusatsu, like giant robot mm-hmm. kind of thing. And there's a lady named Margaret Lesh She's very very important to our childhood, man, because she was at uh, like Marvel Studios with um with Stan Lee and then she became like the head of like Fox Studios and that would be that would be the X Men cartoon, the the Bruce Tim Batman joint, Pop Power Rangers, like the tick solid dope dope stuff, you know, um Masked Rider, like a whole lot of stuff. So she was at Marvel and he was the first guy to discover the Power Rangers and, and, and when it like the Super Sentai stuff and wanted to bring that to the States and do the exact thing that, you know, Ham, Ham Saban did when, like when I was a kid. Uh, so, so like, you know, he, he had his hooks in for sure and they didn't talk about that. Yeah, it surprised me a little bit. There was one piece of footage like with after the boardroom piece when he's like at a desk and you see this character who's this t- so tall that you can't see his head in the camera. I'm like, that's Jim Shooter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I There's no that. way that's <laughs> not Jim that. Shooter, man. <laughs> because, like, you just saw the tie and, like, the crotch. And uh, there was a... Uh, I saw a Jim Shooter interview where uh, the, the people were asking him about the uh, the original art he has. And he was like, yeah, in my kitchen I have this, uh, this Bill Sienkiewicz uh, portrait he gave me. And then he showed the portrait... And it was a giant painting, and it was just like the tie, and like the it was no face. Yeah, <laughs> it was just like this. That was good. Yeah, that that's another highlight. There was there was footage I think of uh, Stanley and Archie Goodwin going over a script very briefly, but you know like that's some of the thrill for watching yeah. footage like this. And I loved that Flo, uh, you know right. the, the the Marvel character Flo was on there. Uh, we got to hear her talking several times. She kind of got a title card. Um, that stuff I love. That like yeah. like I could watch. I could watch, you know, series about these kinds of different people that were involved in comics and whatever footage you have. 
um, there was some bullpen footage. You know, I, I think um, like I think it was Herb Trimpey was inking at one point. Yeah. And I say that because there's like a Hulk documentary of yeah. of Herb Trimpey in the bullpen and working and stuff. So I, I think that's what that footage was from. Yeah, it's just a Trimpey documentary. Yeah, like yeah. It's, it's just about Herb Trimpey. And in that documentary, you get to see a you know Buscema of uh, reporting uh, flow. Uh, probably a John Romita shows up in there a little bit. Yeah, so I love that kind of stuff, and there were little snippets of that throughout this documentary that, that, you know, very fun to see cameos of these people. I'm not 100% sure, because he would have been a little bit younger than I'm used to seeing the photos of him, but there's, like, one piece of Comic-Con footage where Stan is, like, talking with somebody about character or something and and uh there's another person get ready to ask a question or something and i think it's phil suling mm. not 100 percent sure but he, he's the, the the guy who i'm thinking is suling is like kind of mugging for the camera a little bit and like smiling and things and i think it's him but because i know what he looks like but it would have been younger and i'm trying to like extrapolate you know like reverse engineer the fake because like the build is the same and, and stuff like so like there's some real kind of comics history there if you look all in all for for somebody, for a comics lifer, boring. This this documentary was boring. I was trailing off a lot because I've heard the story a million times. And I watched know, it in three pieces over lunches each day. I like, uh, there's this uh, beha- um, body language uh, uh, expert panel YouTube channel where these guys just grab footage of, you know, Charles Manson and talk about, like, the, the, the smiles and all the little ticks that he does. You know, they do that for everybody. And uh, one of the things that they say um, whenever somebody's in a confession or something is, like, if it feels rehearsed, like, like uh, if it's the same story every time and the pauses are the same every time and all that, like, it's, 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 it's fake. You know, like, like, it, 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 it um, rings as false. And that's what I'm hearing, you know, and I got the bullshit detector, right? So, like, I can only listen to so much of that. And in an hour and a half documentary, maybe a half hour at a time is good because I know I don't trust what he's saying because he's a salesman so that's why like I call like when he brought that military stuff and uh like I I, I got sent here I'm I'm so sad I didn't get to go to combat like it's just like I can't believe almost anything that the fella says man or I have to listen with a critical ear and uh that maybe that's one of the big um that's one of the big uh, like life lessons to take from from somebody like that also, I do think that there was perhaps a Freudian slip or two of uh, when he's talking about his daughter and says, we spoiled her rotten. And I think that was might have been one of the most truthful things <laughs> that he said in the whole goddamn thing. <laughs> That's funny. It's funny to think of, like, what were the true statements? And, 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 and then and the, there's the oddness also of, like, a girl junior kind of thing. Like that's that's some that's some wild behavior. Yeah, it's unusual. You don't see that every day, man. That's a, there's a lot of vanity, a lot of a lot of uh, narcissism. You know, it's like dual narcissists getting married. There was a kind of an interstitial piece that would run through most of this documentary, and it was it looked like a vintage comic that was kind of showing the working of the bullpen or the way that comics were, the way they made comics. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was like a drawn piece. Yeah, it, it looked like. Because they they use a lot of real pages and then they do like kind of a an effect I don't really oh, yeah, care yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like but a... there's one group of drawn pages that come throughout the documentary. They'll put them in, and it looked like bullpen, kind of like this is the nuts and bolts of what's happened, how we're making a comic. And it would pop up now and then, like is it kind of a an interstitial, you know, cutting from one scene to another or whatever. And I was trying to figure out is that a real comic? Because yeah. I I don't remember reading it. But it looked authentic. And I bet you it's something that's like in the back of an annual or maybe in a foom or somewhere. It yeah. struck me as like, that's real That's real stuff. And, and what is that comic? So I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. You know, our, our audience may be able to fill in that gap because it appears a few times. That, that goes to show like just how I'm trailing off and stuff. Like the one piece of like a comic page being worked on that I saw was it was the same footage that was in Comic Confidential when he's talking comics code and they're like whiting out mm-hmm. some soldiers like but that's not what you're talking about no this yeah. was uh this was that effect of like it's a full screen and you're going to see kind of like a couple of pages zoomed in and they would do the thing of like the ink appears and then like the color sort of fills in in a way that's unnatural they did that effect quite a yeah, bit yeah and also that was insulting because it's crayons yeah it, like like <laughs> suggesting that comics are colored with crayons 
it, it is interesting how they figure that out. I was so happy with the footage they used. There's a lot of like uh, vintage New York City footage. I'm always a sucker for that yeah. kind of stuff. But then it's like there were a lot of chances where they could have shown original art maybe or actual pages, and often they didn't. They would kind of put on some digital effects, and right. it's like... Uh, there's, there's this is this is at this point there's million dollars of art there like yeah. show us that you know it doesn't need doctored up but you know it is what it is there is uh, another piece to watching that where many times uh throughout watching it I, w I was thinking like we can do this like you and i you you and i could could make youtube videos that, that look exactly like this man with the same kind of editing and things like what you know if you have the same raw materials and, and like we could acquire those raw materials and, and and do that ourselves but uh it did put me in the mindset a little bit of like our own productions of like how we can best show off um comics and the thing the things that we talk about so that, that was like one positive thing but all in all uh, i was largely very bored because i heard it all um I'm, I'm shocked. I really do think a lot of you guys out there, like you watch stuff to hate it. And, and, and I just don't understand that mentality whatsoever. But also that's, that's, um, you know, I'm 41 now, like, like maybe, uh, our mentalities are different because I'm trying to like make the best out of uh, the time that I have. And, uh, you know, based on the feedback, watched it was just largely bored and was not disappointed in Stanley any more than I've ever been. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same. I, I, I'm kind of curious if you guys are watching this and you see it. I'm curious what people think. You know, if it's your first exposure to this story, I would highly recommend that untold, untold tale story of Marvel. Yes, yeah, the Sean Howe book. We we mentioned it a couple of times. If you're interested in this history of Marvel, that's a pretty good book. It'll give you certainly another perspective on a lot of that history. Um, and there's tons of those resources out there. If you're interested in the history of Marvel Comics, there's a lot of places you can find more information about it. This is definitely, you know, it's the it's this is a Vince McMahon kind of production. You know, totally. this is Disney selling Disney rope, and uh, I don't know, nothing wrong with that. I, 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 it's kind of the way the world works at this point. But like you said, I don't know that I came away with anything significantly new or different or surprised. Hey Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new videos are available. Uh, the vids are brought to you by many things. Man, the cartoonist Kayfabe Patreon is out there. And uh, the King Kayfabers get all the videos before anybody else. They also have access to our live stream recording sessions whenever we're recording a gang of episodes at a, at a time. Uh, this mitigates the kayfabe effect because they're able to make wise purchasing decisions and, and buy books on the aftermarket uh, before the videos hit Gen Pop, which uh, you know could pay for itself, we're going to be at Baltimore Comic Con early September. Do we know the date? Second weekend in September. Okay. I'd have to check the dates, but second weekend in September. We'll see you guys out there at uh, Baltimore Comic Con. We'll bring like a little sample of all of our goodies. But uh, at the end of the day, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. Let's take a look at some of our books, Jimmy. Uh, the Hip Hop Family Tree Grand Design. Did you hear me wheeze and gasp <laughs> at, at picking this thing up? It's got to be two and a half pounds. Uh, this is collecting the the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree plus 140 pages of additional material inside of like one handy dandy hardcover. This is cheaper than your Marvel omnibuses, man. So you get a good value for your money's worth. There's going to be an X Men Grand Design trilogy trade paperback coming out. There's a volume or two of that out of print, so scoop that up. And Red Room Crypto Killers is the latest focus. Uh, the fourth issue is being solicited, going to be in store soon. There's going to be a trade paperback early next year. Uh, and I'm serializing a daily comic strip on my Patreon called Switchblade Shorties right now. Uh, it's going to be a daily strip that is going to see the wider world uh, once I have more of those in the can. What do you got, Jim? My latest comic is the self-published True Crime Funnies. I have sold out of this physical edition. However, it's available on my website as a PDF along with several other zines and mini comics there. You can also read this on my Patreon at any level. So if you missed this the first time around, there are ways to still read it. Uh, my other books that are available for the young adult reader out there, The Plain Janes, Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live, collecting all of my image Street Angel comics. This is eight full color stories, probably some of the comics I'm most proud of and was out of print, but it's back in print now from Image. So you can get that wherever you buy books. And I don't know why I haven't been holding this one up on every video, but the Hulk Grand Design book, I'm super proud of this one. 
you can see the fluorescent green on the cover. You can see this from probably outside of your comic shop if they have that in stock. And as Ed says, once these things are printed, they're kind of limited edition. Yeah. So this is selling well from what stores tell me. If you haven't picked it up already, you may want to do that soon because who knows about a reprint. A couple other ways uh, we you can help support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, if you let the people know. Yeah, you can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, fanny packs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. Uh, give us some more uh, films that need the Cartoonist Kayfabe review in the comments below. Jimmy, give them the marching order so that we can be on our way. Read more comics.